We are living in some unusual times. And for the past several weeks, at least up until last Wednesday, we were meeting. Uh, we weren't meeting. We were in our homes and uh, trying to worship God from those places. And let me rephrase that. We did worship God from those places. But the question that comes to mind in things like or times or situations like this is when you read the New Testament, sometimes you read that people would meet in the temple. Sometimes you read where someone would have a church that met in their house. We don't see where any churches in the New Testament had church buildings as we have, but that doesn't mean that church buildings are not good or necessary. But there is a need for the church to come together as a church. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, the text we often reference when we think about the Lord's Supper, we'll notice that the church came together or assembled on the first day of the week to break bread. And we'll be looking at some other passages this morning on the importance of the church meeting together and some of the advantages, some essential reasons and advantages for the church to be together. I love being with my brethren. I wish our community was a little tighter where in our jobs were not scattered all over the place. And some of us live down the street from one another and we could walk and sit on one another's porch and visit, but we're scattered, we're not close. So we treasure these times that we come together, but for the most part, the reason that the church assembles is for spiritual reasons. When, when Luke recorded that the church came together to break bread, it obviously had a focus on the Lord's Supper. I do not believe the Lord's Supper is the most important thing we do, but it is a very important thing that we do. And you take the cross and the death of Christ away, none of the rest of it matters. So there is an emphasis on the Lord's Supper, and I believe that's something we can think about as we consider being together on this first day of the week. But I want to share something with you that I was reading recently, and, and I probably should have made that a little larger. If you can't see my text where of God's people being a part of a larger assembly. Turn with me to Hebrews 12 and look at verses 18 through 24. I'm not going to dwell on the details of these verses, but I want you to see something here that captured my attention. We are called by different names, the churches in the New Testament. Uh, Paul wrote for the Church of God at Corinth. He talked about the churches of Christ saluting one another in Romans 16, 16. And, and yet, there's a larger group that belongs to God, that's a part of God, than just us. Notice, beginning with verse 18, you recall we studied Hebrews, and Hebrews is addressed to Hebrew Christians, many of whom were becoming unfaithful to the Lord. Some had already, and these people knew the Old Testament, and they, so the writer says, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched into a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom of whirlwind. This was at Mount Sinai when the children of Israel were moving from Egypt to the Promised Land. And there was a time when God was up on the mountain and he, he says, you've not come to that and that blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which sound was such as those who heard begged to be, to be no further, to, to no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command. Even if a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. These Hebrews could reflect on this. It was a part of their history. They knew what the writer was talking about during the time of Moses. And he says it was so terrible. The sight was that Moses said, I'm full of fear and trembling. It even scared Moses. But you've not come to that. The writer says, but you have come to Mount Zion into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And I want you to notice what the writer says that these people have come to. 
the, the, the city of the living God in Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, that's the church, but also to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. So we're, this is a part of a heavenly realm. Yes, the angels are in heaven and we're on earth, but we're a part of a spiritual realm of being. You know, that makes us pretty special. I've never seen an angel. I hope to see one someday. They're not little girls or little women with cute little wings. They were always males, but nonetheless, we'll finally see what an angel is in heaven. In heaven. But notice, and to God. And to God the judge of all and the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. What the writer's talking about is a connection with all of these and we're not angels and angels aren't humans and Jesus is now in a resurrected Form at the right hand of God, and God is a spirit, John 4 24. And then, but we are a part of heavenly Jerusalem. One of the things I learned early on in my life, even before I became a Christian, was the value of God's people being together. <coughs> And so when we come into this building, there's nothing holy about the wood or the carpet or any of this. Um, even this Bible, this paper, the words are spiritual words, but it's a paper book. But God is here. Now, I'm not going to say God wasn't in your home when we were meeting under those conditions. He was. When we would commune to the Lord's Supper at home, the Lord was there. But he's here with us. And I wanted to lay that down as something to think about as we consider the value and importance of the assembly because God's people are part of a larger assembly. It's not just you and me. There's God the Father. There's Jesus Christ. There's the Spirit. There are the spirits of just men made perfect. Who are those? Those are people who died and are, were faithful to God. They're no longer with us. They're spirit beings now. But we have a relationship with them. One day, we'll see them, and we'll change like Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 15. His body will change. Now, with that as a foundation, think about the first day of the week. Why do we meet on the first day of the week? Well, I believe when John talked about being in the Spirit on the Lord's Day in Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, I'm fully convinced that the Lord's Day he was talking about was the first day of the week. That John, in some way, in the spirit, he was worshiping God. He was on the Isle of Patmos, and he, some believe he was living in a cave, and, and he'd been sent there because he, it, was, it was a part of persecution, but he didn't die. He was still alive. But he was focusing on God in a situation, and I thought about this, that he couldn't do anything about. Here we were the last few weeks. We were stuck at home or wherever we were, and, and I thought about Paul being in prison. He couldn't go meet with the saints. But you somehow Paul would have found a way to worship God on the first day of the week. I don't think we possibly, and I say we, counting myself, could take for granted the value and the preciousness of our ability to assemble. Because the Lord was raised on the first day of the week. And you read that in all four Gospels. All four of them record that. Pentecost, if you go look at Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 and following, Pentecost fell on the 50th day after Passover. That made Pentecost the first day of the week. What happens in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost? The church is established. And then you have the, the, uh, the, the church in Troas. In Acts chapter 20, they gather together on the first day of the week to break bread. There's a reason for that. Go back and look at verse 6. You see that, that Paul waited seven days before meeting with the church. Uh, he waited until the church would gather. The Corinthians, according to 1 Corinthians 16 too, 
met on the first day of the week, as, we, as Paul talked about the contribution for the four saints in Jerusalem. There's a Bible precedent for the first day of the week. Not only is there a Bible precedent for the first day of the week, there's a Bible precedent for the church meeting on the first day of the week and what some of the things we are to do as we meet. Let me ask, ask you a question. Let's be practical just for a moment and I'll proceed with the lesson. How do you think you would fare if you couldn't meet with the church on a regular basis? Some of us would survive, right? We would not fail the Lord. Paul was stuck in prison. John is stuck on the Isle of Patmos. Fair enough. But the question is not, it's, it's a specific personal question. How do, think, how do you think you would fare? If you couldn't meet with the church on a regular basis, would you possibly fall away? Would you become weak spiritually? Now flip it over. Does it help you to be with the church on a regular basis? You see, God has his reasons for this. And I think sometimes we have done these checklists where we meet on Sunday. And I've seen people who will hardly ever meet with the church. Oh, and they'll show up every now and then and they'll come take the Lord's Supper. They don't get it. They're, they're not understanding all of these things. I'm not talking about people who couldn't be here because of circumstance. I'm talking about people who just didn't put the Lord first in their lives. But, but the first day of the week is a precedent. And then I think about the value of being together. And the first thing I wanted to put on the list was prayer. You see in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, a part of what those new Christians continued in, they continued in the do apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, fellowship, and in prayers. My understanding, as I read that text in its context, that was happening on Pentecost Day. Because you see in the next verse that the people were seeing all the miracles that the apostles, plural, were doing. So they're still all together on the first day of the week. And one of the things they did was pray. <clears throat> and then you look at 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8. That Paul says to the men they are to pray in every place. Let me qualify that quickly. That doesn't mean when a man leads a prayer that a woman doesn't pray with him. I try to pray with him. I'm not leading the prayer. But the idea is the leading of the prayers by the men. But the idea is Paul is making a commandment that men should be leading prayers. And I want to think about the value of that in the assembly. I pray to myself. I don't count it. But I do a lot. And I still don't think I ever pray enough. Do you? But I do a lot. But you see, nobody hears me say that prayer but God. When I look back when I was a young man, very young, we went to worship services on a regular basis in our home. We did not miss. We would go on Sunday school, we'd be at worship in the morning, we'd go back on Sunday night, we'd be back on Wednesday nights. If there was a gospel meeting, I don't know if we would go every night, but we would try to. My dad had a job where he sometimes couldn't be there every night, but we tried. And, and if there was something going on with the church, some kind of a, an event, you know, just to get together, we would go. And we would go to gospel meetings and other places in the Chattanooga area. I mean, I grew up in that environment. But one of the things I remember learning was listening to the men pray. Brother Bob Bryson was a good friend of mine. He's been gone, I think, since 2014. He was in his 90s, gospel preacher. He said, you know, Roger, you can learn a whole lot about a man by the way he prays. I'm not saying that it means a man is weak spiritually if another man prays deeper. But I'll tell you what, I've heard some prayers in life from, in, in assemblies, in this, because they're public, that have taught me much. I listen to what they pray about. Things they bring up that maybe nobody else thought about. And, and 
I, so I listened. I learned. You learn about the needs of people. By the way, Jacob Meadows is in Atlanta, as I understand it. We didn't get him on the announcements because we didn't have anything written, but we want to remember him and their family. But so, so how did we learn about Jacob? Because we were here. There's value in being here and to pray, and and we unite together in prayer as a church. And 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 then you're you're going out the door and say, well. Roger, would you pray for my aunt so and so? You know, they they're not in announcements, but you know they're having a hard time. And well, we don't learn about that when we're not here. But when we're here, these things we learn. And and you look at James chapter five, verses fourteen to sixteen, where James says, "If any of you, if you're sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them." And I do not believe that James chapter 5 is an assembly setting, okay? But I believe there's a principle there that you find out about things when you're together. And, and he says in verse 16 that we should confess our faults one to another and pray for one another. That's not necessarily in an assembly. One of us or a couple of us could be meeting together for lunch and somebody says, you know, one brother or sister says to another, you know, I'm having a hard time with this. Would you pray for me? And, and I found a lot of value over there, coffee, talking with people. But then you come in here, there's a time to make your sins known publicly to the church and pray for one another. That strengthens us. Amen? It does. And when we fail to do it, we are weak. So I'm just, and you make your own list because this is certainly not exhaustive for some of the value of being together and praying in the assembly and then, and then preaching and teaching. Listen, what I'm doing right now is takes more time than anything else. And somebody says, yeah, it takes too much time. But, you know, it does, but it's not the most important thing we're doing. <laughs> but it is a vital part of what we're doing. When you read Acts chapter uh, well, Matthew 28 and verse 20. After people are baptized, Jesus said that you need to be teaching them all things that I've said to you. The church is a teaching institution. We need to be in Bible classes. We need to have good, solid Bible classes. We need to have preaching and teaching because... I don't know about you, but I still need to learn some things. I'm still in this learning phase. And I hope I'm learning. But to teaching and preaching, in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 20, all of that was Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, on the first day of the meeting of the church. And then verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching. And I'm convinced that was still on the same day. And then Acts 20 and verse 7, Paul met with the church and they, they came together to break bread and Paul preaches a lesson because the church needed it. I believe that we see a pattern in Scripture of how we should do things. But there's value in this. I'm not the smartest guy you've ever heard preach. And I know that, but I promise you I'll share something of value with you today because I'm getting my information from the Word of God. And so right now I'm seeing some things. The need for preaching and teaching. Somebody says, well, you know, preacher, I, I don't come all the time, but I, I, you know, I study at home. Well, what have you been studying lately? Why don't you tell us what you've been studying? Well, if they can't answer that, they're not telling the truth. The reason I say that is we need encouragement to study. We need to be prodded. All of us, preachers too. I go to, to preacher events to, to, be, to, be, to be a better Christian first. Amen? A better Christian first, then to be a better preacher. But in the assembly, we, we have preaching and teaching. <coughs> and you could go all and on with your list. And what about our singing? You know, I don't know what the singing was like when we were doing it from our patio and others who were participating. And 
and, and, and I don't know what it was like in your home. God didn't ask you for your voice in the first place. You don't have to try out for some talent show to please God in worship and song. He's not asking for that. The world has a twisted view of singing and worship a lot of times. But let's talk about one passage here. In Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, or dwell within you richly, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness or grace in your hearts to God. Didn't Paul put a whole lot in one sentence? Did he ever? And so it's like, okay, what is it that we sing? The word of Christ, the, the message of Christianity is in our singing. And, and it must dwell richly within us. <clears throat> I imagine there was a lot of songwriting or uh, people making up songs in the first century. So listen to this. And, and they would come together and maybe that maybe one church would be the only one to know that song. But they, they took scripture and they'd make a song. They didn't have these hymn books. I know they had the Psalms, but they had to have the word of Christ and then, what do you do, though, in this? In this assembly, when we're singing, we are teaching and we're admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There's a broad spectrum of psalms to choose from. And then we sing with thankfulness in our hearts to God. But I wanted to move down and look at something here. This, these terms, first of all, one to another in these passages, uh, Okay, it's grammatically classified as reciprocal reflexive pronouns. What does that mean? That means we all sing at the same time and to one another. Let's break it down to simplistic language. You sing, I sing, we sing. To one another. How many of you have learned something <coughs> valuable from a hymn at times? How many of you have been encouraged to do something about your life by singing a hymn at times. How many of you have walked the aisle because of the words of the hymn, the, the invitation was given, but the words of the hymn says, oh yeah, why not tonight? Just as I am without one plea. And so we have all these things going on, but we teach, we learn, and that's why songs need to be scriptural. <clears throat> and it's because it's the word of Christ, but we sing at the same time. And that's one place that a woman can teach publicly without usurping authority. She's singing in the, in the auditorium with everybody else. She's not taking a role of authority, just the words, and we're all singing together. And so we can, we can do that. But I wanted to think about that word admonishing for just a moment. What does it mean? We, we do this in the assembly. How do I know? To one another. Let me make a quick statement. Could four or five of us gather together at the park over here sometime and may, or maybe 15, you know, everybody's not there, but we can sing. Or could my family just be together and sing and do this? Yes, yes. But in the assembly, I believe when Paul is writing Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3, 16, he's talking to the churches about what they do in the assembly. And one of the things that we do in song is admonish one another. That word admonish means to put to mind. It means, went backwards, sorry, put to mind. It means to caution or reprove gently. It means to warn. You can do these through singing. And so the, the preacher preaches his message and maybe, and maybe the song is about obedience for a particular Sunday or Sunday night or whenever gospel meeting. We do this in song. I cannot admonish you if I'm not with you. The value of the, see the value of the assembly begins to be very, very important, doesn't it? And so we do this in song. So let's look at it again. I want to look at the end of it. So we do these things with one another, with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and then singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 
that may be personal blessings. Maybe just you and your family know about it. Maybe somebody just obeyed the gospel and you're singing one of the songs that relates to that and you're thanking God for this new soul. I mean, you see the power not only of the songs, but of us being together. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know how I would fare if I couldn't meet with the church on a regular basis. I just don't. I would hope I would remain faithful. But you know what? When Paul wrote those letters, one of the things I wonder when he wrote Philippians 4, 4, <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say rejoice. I wonder if he didn't write that as much for Paul as he did anybody else. He was by himself. Oh, he preached to the people in prison, but he wasn't with the church on Sunday mornings like we are. And so you'd have to work really, really hard. How many of you have to work hard in it anyway to be faithful? How many of you go away from the service feeling like you're better prepared to face the world? I hope we are. I try to be. But we need this. And then the Lord's Supper. Oh, how we can spend a whole 40 days on that. But we see that the Corinthians, if you want to take the notes, 1 Corinthians 11, 17, 18, and 20, they, they, they came together as a church to take the Lord's Supper. People started asking questions on Facebook and maybe through some other internet medias or wherever, you know, well, is it right for us not to meet with the church just because this virus is going around? Are we afraid to meet together? And is it right for us to meet in our homes? People were sincere about it. I'm not criticizing anybody. And it was a fair question. Well, we know we none of us if you have the flu, what do you do? You stay at home. If it's possible that you have a communicable disease or some kind of very uh, infectious disease that, that's easily caught by another, would you be loving enough to stay away from people until you got over it? Lepers were separated from the community for a reason. This is temporary, though. And I pray to God that people will be careful and we can meet together. We need to be careful, but I'm so glad we're here. But they came together for the Lord's Supper. Was it wrong for us to have the Lord's Supper as our family on our patio or in our living room or wherever you were? No. No, I believe we should do it. But ideally, let's look at it together. Jesus' blood affects everybody. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew 26, 28. What well, we've all experienced the remission of sins. And when we participate in the Lord's Supper, we remember the blood of Jesus Christ. All, he shed his blood for all of us. It's a community thing in the church. Jesus purged the whole church with his blood, didn't he? The entire church. And look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24. As we look at a couple of texts together this morning, um, the Paul reiterates what Jesus said in the Gospels. But I want to look at verse 24 in particular, not all of this. And when he had given thanks, Paul said, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. This do, or do this. In remembrance of me. And then you look at 1 Corinthians 10, flip over a page I do in my Bible, verses 16 and 17. Paul is talking about not fellowshipping with demons. This cup of blessing which we bless, it's a sharing, it's a communion, it's a fellowship of the blood of Christ. And we're in spiritual fellowship as Christians. And is not the bread which we break a sharing of the body of Christ. Now that is personal. I don't take the Lord's Supper for you or vice versa. I take it to commune personally with my Lord. <clears throat> That's why I don't want somebody interrupting me during the Lord's Supper unless it's an emergency. And I don't think you do either. But... But look at verse 17. Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, 
for we all partake of the one bread. I'm picturing the church being together, but also the oneness of the body. It's a precious thing to come together as God's people and remember that Jesus shed his blood for all of us and remember that he suffered. He suffered in that, in that body for all of us. And it's just grape juice. But it's not just grape juice. It's a representation of blood that was shed to pay for every sin you and I ever committed and ever will commit if we're faithful. That's powerful. That's a powerful symbol. And it brings us together as God's people. And I love being with the brethren, not just for those, but for all of it. And in our giving on the first day of the week. Obviously, when Paul wrote that to the church in Corinth, he was talking about when the church came together, when they would come together. And on the first day of the week, they, they, each one of you lay by in store as he has prospered. And so that was for the four saints in Jerusalem. Obviously, the church has to take care of its needs. And so every first day of the week, I lay by in store, you lay by in store. But I want to think about the value of that, being together. Think about meeting a need. And we all do this together. It's something we're all a part of. Giving together to help the cause of Christ. Giving together to help some poor brother or sister that's in need. Giving together to show, an, by example, when I was a little guy, still having to sit with my parents, I saw my dad's contribution check one Sunday. He wasn't showing it to me, I just saw it and I said, wow. I never asked him how much money he made in comparison to what was on that check, but I promise you this, it was generous. I learned something. I learned something. And if I'd never seen that, I wouldn't have learned that. Now, I don't show uh, I guess we all know what we give. I don't show it to him. But we see the board. We know what we're giving as a church. And it's a way to show our love and appreciation for what God has done for us. We are a physically, financially blessed country. I don't care what you think about the economy right now. I don't see anybody who looks like they're too hungry except under normal circumstances. We're not doing without. And if you are, please send somebody to church know that. We don't want anybody to be there. We're doing all right. I don't know how much where this economy is going, but I'm not going to change my giving. It's going to remain the same. Because I, and I do it with my brethren. And I want to think about what the writer said as he comes close to the end of the letter to the Hebrews. And if you can't read all that, turn your Bibles to Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. Very serious and sobering context. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Stay solid. Stay faithful. Don't move to the right or the left. Stay strong. Do not waver. Because God, he's, he's faithful. He's promised. If we're faithful, we'll get to go to heaven. We'll get to be with him forever. And then he talks about some of the things that take place in the assembly. I didn't get that. Could you try again? And I don't know how to turn that off. I'm sorry. So incredible. So God is promised. He's faithful. But in the assembly, and the reason I know it's in the assembly because of what he says in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some, but what do you do in the assembly? You stimulate one another to love and good works. I can't do that, and you can't do that if we're not in one another's presence and talking about it. I remember I was preaching one time in a certain place in a certain congregation, and and a brother who had formerly been an elder, he came up and maybe in a joking fashion, I don't know, he said, well, don't be talking about all these things we need to do. I said, why not? 
I was just young enough to do it. I said, why not? Is that what we do? Talk about things we can do. For, why do we have we care meetings? Uh, you don't have to answer that. You know why we do it. But sometimes we do it in the foyer, don't we? Or maybe through a sermon or Bible class, things we can do. And when we fail to assemble, we're not stimulated to love and good works. Now, that doesn't mean a person can't do good works on their own. But how much more stimulated are we when we're together and talking about the things we can do? And not only that, but we encourage one another to be faithful. And in the context of Hebrews, that was very, very important for those people. But then, you know, don't remember, let's not remove ourselves too far from those Hebrew Christians. Because very easily, any one or more of us could be where some of those people were. They were leaving the Lord. Don't you do that. I'm begging you, don't you ever leave the Lord. And let the church, as we assemble as God's people, let these meetings be a spiritual catalyst to make us stronger, better able to face Monday and Tuesday, and when we're able to come back in on Wednesday to be there and stimulate one another and encourage one another. As we think about these things, teaching, praying, singing, giving, participating in the Lord's Supper, all of these things, we can do any of those things outside the Lord's, outside the assembly as a, except the Lord's Supper, unless it's an emergency. I'm not going to stay at home and take the Lord's Supper unless it's an emergency. I believe the Lord wants me in the assembly. I know he does. Think about these things. and Let's take advantage of these assemblies and to the best of our ability, be in every one that we can. Maybe someone this morning who has heard something said that's caused you to think about your relationship with God. To use the word again, how are you faring with God? It's a personal question. Do you need prayer? Do you need encouragement? Do you need to respond to the Lord's invitation in some way? Is there something that, that you just need prayers about? You know, I can stand <laughs> far enough away from you. You can write something down. We're not so, uh, it's not so unsafe that we can't take care of things. Write it down. But if you have a need, please come as we stand and as we sing. All things are in need. Come to the feast. Come.